Why do we keep Shabbat? What is the Sabbath? Why do we keep and follow Torah? How do we keep Torah? Who is Yahusha? Who is Yahuwah? Are Yahusha and Yahuwah the same? What are the commandments that we follow today? Is there a difference between the Tanakh, the Old Testament, and the Brit Hadashah, the New Testament? Are they one book? Or are they two books? All these questions and more are answered as we step into our new Q&A form. Join us as we walk through the pages of the Father's Word, rightly dividing truth to answer burning questions vital to every believer. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Glad to see everybody here. Everybody on YouTube watching, praise Yah. Um, just grateful for another week. And we're going to open with a word of prayer. Father Yah, we want to thank you so much for just protecting us and guiding us, Father. We also want to thank you for being by our side through the trials and allowing us to learn the lessons and become stronger, Father, in you and in your son. We ask for your strength, Father. We ask for your grace, your mercy. We ask for your forgiveness of our sins. I ask that you cleanse us, Father. Strengthen our hearts, our minds. Strengthen the hearts of our children. I ask that you please give us your wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Help us to lead our families. Help us to lead our friends. And help us to build each other up, Father. We thank you for this time of fellowship. We ask that you help us, even in our hearts and minds, to cease to, to Shabbat from everything that you see as a distraction, everything that you see as contrary to you, Father. We ask that you allow this study to to be enlightening and to guide us through more of understanding father enlighten us tonight father we ask for your presence with every family here and every family who's observing your word father and desire to, to know who you are we ask that you bless them be with them as well we ask this in the name and authority of your son we pray hallelujah amen all right our first model scripture is malachi chapter 3 verse 16 to 18 and it says, and then they that feared Yahuwah spake often one to another, and Yahuwah hearkened and heard it, and a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared Yahuwah and that thought upon his name. And they shall be mine, saith Yahuwah of hosts, in that day when I make up my jewels and I will spare them as a man spares his own son and that serves him, that serves him. Then shall you return and discern between the righteous and the wicked between him that serves Elohim and him that serves him not. Praise Yah. Um, one thing I wanted to point out is the fact that it's talking about those who do think upon him, those who do speak on him, that the Booker's remembrance is before him for them that fear Yahuwah, not um, the Book of Remembrance is in order to equip and strengthen and bless. You know, so the Book of Remembrance is not written for those who, are wicked, those who do not meditate on his word, those who do not speak of him often, those who are ashamed uh, of Yahuwah and, and his son. You know, these are for people who do, who are not ashamed and those who are not ashamed, he was strengthened to be able to determine who amongst them is righteous and wicked, who amongst them is serving Yah, who's not, not to kick them out, but so that way we can build up his people. You know, uh, and I just want to make that clear. Yah never equips us with truth, with understanding, with a discernment to kick people out. He equips us to build up his people. Scripture tells us that the spiritual gifts is for the perfecting of the people, of the saints, not of the dividing of the saints. Yah's word never divides. It divides in a sense, <laughs> but it enlightens people's choices against the word is what separates them from Yah. Uh, you know, so we have to we have to make sure that we understand we are that we fit the description of who Yah is talking about. Let's not just look at these things as romantic statements. Let's look at these statements as 
okay, do I measure up to this description? And if not, that we approach Yah and ask him to, to, to build us up. You know, it's the only way. Praise Yah. Our next verse is um, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. And this is an appeal to the assembly. It says, I appeal to you, dear brothers and sisters, by the authority of the master, Yahushua HaMashiach, to live in harmony with each other. Let there be no divisions in the assembly. Rather, be of one mind, united in thought and purpose. Uh, the reason why it says one mind, united in thought, united in purpose, is because the, the oneness that Yah wants us to have with him is pertaining to the purpose, is pertaining to lining our thoughts up with his thoughts, which is his word. Um, it says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Yahushua Messiah. So the mind aspect is not the same as always being in agreement. The divisions is referring to strife. <clears throat> Fighting one another is what causes division. Despising one another. Uh, disliking one another. Gossiping about one another. Hating each other. That's what causes division. Not disagreements. If you disagree with a despising heart, if you disagree with a hateful heart, if you disagree with a self-centered heart, that's not a, a, a aspect of, uh, the, it's not the, the disagreement's fault. It's what is your, is your relationship with Yah, is your examination of yourself. That is the issue, not the fact that you disagree. Sometimes people use a disagreement to, to um to say that it's the reason why you don't want to be around a person. And that's not, that's not even the reason. The reason is you, your heart, you don't have long suffering. You don't have patience. And when we do that to one another, I'm saying we, when we do that to one another, we have to examine ourselves to see why do I not want to talk to this person because they don't agree with me. Does that make any sense? You know, so we have to make sure that we are, not focusing on the fact that we're disagreeing because disagreement doesn't bring division, strife, jealousy, envy, pride. That's what brings division. You know, just want to uh, just let everybody know that, you know, so when people start separating because of, you know, little ideas, it's not because of the idea. It's because of the person's character. That's why they're separating. You know, and we always got to keep that in mind. And that's why we reach out to people, because we know that they're not separated because we believe something different. They're separated because they, there's an issue that they don't see in themselves. And we're here to help people see. So praise God. All right. I want to remind you guys, um, if you've been blessed by these YouTube videos and blessed by the meetings and just blessed by Assembly of Yahuwah as a whole, we encourage you guys to help us in our efforts of spreading this truth and just being good stewards of not only his word, but also his people taking care of babes and, and guiding them through his word until they're able to walk on their own. You know, so we, we actually encourage everyone to, to help move forward the efforts that is being made with this ministry. And you can go to assembly of forward slash give. And um, you can see all the different, aspects of what uh, the ministry is attempting to do in order to continue to, to give to the people. So praise Yah. And quick study reminders. Everybody's pretty good with these. Raise your hands if you have something to say. Don't just unmute un, uh, yourself and start talking. Um, when you make a comment, be aware of how long you're taking. Uh, one to three minutes is being not only is it being recorded, but uh, sometimes we have to move forward in a study in order to get more clarity. Um, and when you do speak uh, with your comments, please make sure that you use a, a limit of one or two scriptures to support your idea. So that way we can have a dialogue as to why uh, the idea is being presented. You know, so that way we can talk about it. That's what we're here for. That's what this this Q and A is about. To make sure that we're we're leaving on one accord. You know, so when we present it, make sure you present why you believe such things, and be very careful. If you do not have a scripture to support your idea, be very careful as to 
you know, holding on to that idea with a passion, you know, you, there's no need to hold on to an idea if there's nothing to support it. There's no need to believe an idea if there's nothing supporting it. So, um, and I don't want nobody to be offended if anybody's raising hands and it seems like you're being skipped. Um, we're focused, we're, we're monitoring all the new people that's joining. And uh, when we someone raises their hand frequently, we want to go to those who have not raised their hand yet first. But that it's not a discouragement to not raise your hand frequently. You are free to do so as long as you follow the guidelines, you, you, you're okay. All right. So today we've been, um, for the last couple of weeks, we've been breaking down prophetically the Messiah's existence, uh, just statements and, and just acknowledgements from scripture, from the prophets showing how Messiah existed um, as a being, as a son prior that he was brought forth from Proverbs 8, Proverbs 30, verse 4, um, even the, the words of Messiah himself, that he was brought forth, that he came forth, that his goings forth was before creation began. Um, we then went to show the fact that he was leading and guiding his people since Adam. Since the fall of man, he's always been between man and Elohim. We could see that in um, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, where it says there's only one mediator between Elohim and man, you know, um, and it's not Moses. Moses needed a mediator also. Remember that. He needed someone in between himself and Yah as well. You don't just go from wicked to holy by yourself and then go in Yah's presence. <laughs> Our flesh itself has been degrading because of sin. So there has to be someone in between us and Yah. Isaiah 59 verse 2 shows us that our iniquities have separated us from him. So that separation is still there, just like how in a sanctuary, the veil is separating those two compartments and no one can go into the second apartment except for the high priest who intercedes for everyone else. This is who Messiah is. So I, wanna, I want us to keep that in mind. And we're going to kind of, Look at the aspect of why he's referred to as the only begotten. Um, I know that um, we kind of touched on it a lot in regards to him being born or begotten or coming forth uh, out of the Father from Scripture in in the in the uh, before creation. So I want to show um, why there's such a. a a loss in that that perspective is so disconnected from the phrase only begotten son that I want us to kind of keep that in mind um, that this is not about he's not referred to as the only begotten son because he was born through Mary. So I want us to keep that in mind. We did cover a lot of it already. Um, and we're going to go into the new topic, which is what is the Ruach and how does that work? But this is one of the major uh, statements or one of the major things that is said about the Ruach is that Messiah was born by the Ruach, right? That he was born by the spirit. And, but we want to make sure that the scripture shows clearly that he was the only begotten son because he is the only one that has come forth from the father before he is not the only miraculous birth now he may be the only miraculous birth that happened in a certain way but he is not the only miraculous birth that is done by the ruach i want to make that clear all right so let's look at a few aspects of uh of begotten right so we looked at john and i'm going to share my screen and feel free to raise your hand and Ask any questions pertaining to any topic that we've been covering. All right, let's go to the book of John, chapter 3. And I think we did speak about this before. We did speak about John, chapter 3, 16 and 17. And many people say, you know, they they don't really emphasize on who this is talking about, right? 
Um, this says, it says, for Elohim so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Because Elohim sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believes on him is not condemned, but he that believes not in him is condemned already because he have not believed in the name of the only begotten son of Elohim. So this is not talking about the Messiah. Many times people say the gospel is John 3.16. This is a portion of what was being done. This is the initiation of the of the good news of what's of what good is actually going to come to to his people by him sending his son. But one of the things I want to point out is that he's sending his son or he, he's sending a, his only begotten son in the way that is worded is that he's sending something that he has already. He's not sending himself and then it turns into his son on earth. He's sending his son from where he is to the world. You see, he's sending his son to the world so the world can recognize or acknowledge his only begotten son. Not only recognize, it says believe it says, believe in the name, in the authority, believe in the authority, the name of the only begotten son. He is the one, the heir. And I want to point this out in the book of Hebrews. I think uh, Brother Wences and a couple other brothers was dissecting Hebrews a lot. So let's look at in Hebrews chapter one. There's something very interesting that I wanted to point out as well um, about him coming in to the world. And it starts from verse five, Hebrews chapter one, verse five. And it says, unto which one of the angels did he say at any time? He says, which one of the angels did he say at any time? You are my son. Okay. Which one of the angels did he say at any time? You are my son. This is not a phrase asking you to pinpoint that time. It's, tell, it's, a, it's a question that's emphasizing that he has not and that he is referring to someone else. It says, um, you are my son, this day I have begotten thee. And then it says, and again, I will, be a to, I will be to him a father, he shall be to me a son. And then it says, and again, which uh, Brother Wentz has brought this out, uh, I think it was two weeks ago or last week, it says, when he brings in the first begotten into the world, right? This is just like John 3, 16. There's a first begotten. He's well, first, verse five says that his son was begotten. And then after his son was begotten, he was a father and he was a son. And then in verse six, it says, then he brings in the first begotten into the world. So you see the sequence is showing that there's a father and son prior to bringing his first begotten into the world. And here's an interesting aspect. Look at what this word here, he brings in, he brings in the first, it's like a, it's like a, like a demonstration, like he's bringing in, bringing in, but let me, um, let me show you what this Greek word means. G1521. Look at what he says. To introduce. So it's like he's bringing he's bringing the his first begotten in like he's 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 revealing something that he has. He's trying to introduce the world to his first begotten. So he says when he introduces the first begotten into the world, then he says let the messengers of Elohim worship him on the earth. Now I want to point this out also because this is not this is not only referring to um, heavenly beings, right? So it says here, and of the and of the angels, he says. So now he's now he's going to talk to the angels. Then he says, "Who makes his angels spirits and ministers flame and fire?" But here it says, "Let all the angels of Elohim worship him." And when we saw when he was 
when the first begotten was brought into the world, we saw that there was three wise men that were messengers. We saw the three shepherds that were messengers. And then we saw the, the cherubims and the seraphims that were also messengers. So I want to make sure that we understand that the word angels is not exclusive for heavenly beings. It means anyone who is a bringing a message for Yahuwah, anyone who's delivering or bearing a message for Yah is referred to as a messenger, a malakim in Hebrew, a anglos in Greek. You know, this is this is the word that's being used. Um, so we see here that he's introducing that first his son is begotten and he says, me and my, my son, we're, this is our relationship. Then he says, then he's going to introduce the first begotten into the world. You know, so it's very important that we understand this sequence also that kind of gives us an indication as to why he's referred to as the only, only begotten son. Yes, Brother Monair. Hey, shalom. Shalom, shalom so, uh, Real quick before you move on, the, the Hebrews verse, um, this day have I begotten thee, that you just read. I'm yeah. in the car. Um, I was having a discussion months ago with somebody, someone about that, and the objection was that that verse is referring to the actual birth of Messiah in the flesh because the idea of a day started in Genesis, right? The first chapter of Genesis, um, where the first day was created. Before that, um, there wouldn't have been time as we know it. So right. when it says, this day have I begotten the, um, you know, their, their thought process is that it's uh, referring to the birth. And so I, I want to know how you would respond to that objection. Um, the, the sentence itself shows the dynamic of his birth and then introducing the first begotten into the world, you know, so there, it shows a difference between being introduced into the world and then him being begotten. But that verse is actually from Samuel uh, Psalms chapter two. So when you go to Psalms chapter two, you'll see here um, in verse six and seven, you'll see it says, yet have I set my king, on my holy hill of Zion. And then it says in verse seven, I will declare this decree. Yahuwah has said to me, you are my son. This day have I, this day I have, have I begotten thee. And then later on in the same chapter, David emphasizes on the difference between Yahuwah and his actual son. And he says, serve Yahuwah with fear and rejoice with trembling and then it says, kiss the son, lest he be angry, and you perish from the way. When his wrath is kindled, but a little, blessed are all they that put their trust in him. So the as David is actually ref not referring to his birth, but referring to a son that he says to presently, because he's, he's talking present tense, serve Yah now. And he's saying, pay homage to the son now. This is not talking to his about his birth because um, Messiah even mentions that David spoke about him, called him master before he was even born. You know, and um, it wasn't something that uh, there's a lot of instances of of him referring to his actual relation with him or, or his birth um, before earth and him being set up as a king before earth. Before he was here, it, he was already set up as that. And before he was here, he was always reverenced. He was already reverenced according to here. So the same verse where the Hebrews is taking it from is Psalms chapter two. And we see here, David is presently talking about a father and a son to recognize both father and son uh, when he was alive. You know, so the idea that Hebrews is now twisting it and saying it's talking about um, his earthly birth, you know, that doesn't. So why would David say, pay homage to him lest you perish from the way at that time? Why didn't he say um, you shall pay homage to him and you shall 
And, you know, why didn't he talk future tense? He's talking about present tense. David is talking about what he is doing himself, you know. And um, last week, we also talked about the presence of his preexistence, how he walked with, um, how he walked with Yah, uh, with his people, how he walked with Israel, and that Israel was supposed to obey him, even as a, as a spiritual messenger, they were supposed to obey him. And they didn't obey him according to the book of Judges. And then he did not drive out the nations as was promised to him, as was told to Moses. You know, so, you know, the, the idea that he introduced his first begotten into the world means that he was born on this earth or that something that's the sentence doesn't even structure that way. When we talk English, it doesn't even work that way. If I say I introduce my son to the people and then we're sitting there waiting for my son to be born, that that's not even, you know, people will look at me like I'm weird, you know, because that's not even how we talk. I think sometimes we talk so po we look at scripture like it's so poetic that we don't see that he's saying plain statements. There's, these guys are talking to us plainly, like we're just reading old English, but they're talking to us plainly, telling us what's going on. Um, I hope that that made sense, brother, but. Keep the keep the questions coming. I know you're probably looking around like I got more questions. <laughs> <laughs> All right, brother JP. Uh, shalom, shalom, shalom. Uh, I was thinking nice about uh, Hallelujah. I was thinking about the word because I wanted to go to the Hebrew, and I was I found the word in the Hebrew that says uh, mol moladeth, which means I mean, it's used as begotten, I believe, one time maybe, but it's interesting because the word itself, the word itself means by implication, lineage, or native country, also offspring or family. Which word? I just thought that was interesting. Uh, it's the Hebrew word that they use for begotten. Mm. It's H4138. And uh, as I looked it up in the, the lexicon, uh, just to kind of see if there was a Hebrew word that they use in that similar way. Um, and the way that they use it, uh, I just want to kind of bring that out. So that way, just to kind of see how it looked in the Hebrew as well, and, and not just in the Greek. Um, okay. They use it in one, I mean, they use it quite a bit, this word begotten, but it's in used like in Genesis. and You said H3, H, you said uh, which? So one of them is, H4138. H4138. Moldet, Moladet. And that's the Hebrew word that they use for begotten in, in a few verses. Um, talking about, you know, children born or things like that. But I just want to bring that out just to have a Hebrew word that, that shows uh, begotten as well. Oh, right, right. So Mola, Moladet. Right. Moladet means nativity, play, uh, birth, lineage, family, offspring, uh, kindred. Um, and you said you wanted to, let's look at no, this. I just want to bring out that word because it, it's the Hebrew word for begotten. Oh, right, right. Absolutely. And it's all emphasizing on deriving from, coming from, uh, you know, native and, you know, those phrases like that. So absolutely. Absolutely. I think, um, Sometimes we lose we lose sight of that that aspect. Like we lose sight of that that aspect of uh, I think it's just language. Like we're not we don't we don't pay attention to language because we think again. Um, I don't want to keep saying this, but this has been a problem for for me when I first started studying on my own and moving away from the romantic poet poet poetic way of of looking at what it what it plainly says you know um though there were some poets everybody in scripture wasn't a poet you know so it's, these things are real plain and sometimes just simply by looking at a sentence structure we could understand what it's actually saying but sometimes we we uh there's a lot of indoctrination that we've gotten from from uh these organizations and sometimes it keeps it keeps blurring up the 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 clarity of it, the clearness of it. But absolutely, Moladet, 
um, being begotten native. Uh, that's the, there's another word that we use when we first started. It was in, um, in Micah, remember the prof, the prophetic verse that we used, Micah chapter five, verse two, I'm going to get that Hebrew word. It was, uh, goings forth, right. And it was matzah, right. So matzah, which again, talking about his goings forth was from everlasting, H4163, H4163, um, matzah, which means which means family descent. Again, there's a constant reference of being a descendant of, right? And um, this is why it's so important that we understand this. So in Matthew 16, where Messiah asked them saying, who do, who do you, who do they say the son of man is? And they saying all these earthly prophets. And then he says, but who do you say I am? And then it says, you are the Messiah, the son, the son. Whenever we look at the term son, when we're talking to one another, there's a clear indication like, okay, you, you came from someone else. <laughs> you belong to someone else, right? Where's your father? You know, like it's automatic in our minds. But then when it comes to the Messiah and his identity, not, a, not even like, um, and look who's revealing this to him. It says flesh and blood, verse 17, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father, which is in heaven, is showing Peter that he is his son. So that he's, he's again, like what Hebrew says, introducing, making known his son to the world. Making known his son. And um, I think this is very important to understand this is why he's referred to as the only begotten son. He's not referred to as the only begotten son because he was born through Mary. Now, that was a special uh, case, but there were many different special cases that were done by the Ruach. And I'm going to show one instance, right? But let me, let me go to Brother Charles before we move forward. Go ahead, Brother Charles. Shabbat shalom. Um... Shabbat shalom. I want to say something else, but I'm going to just go with this because it'll take me time to ask you that question. But uh, if this is going out the way, then don't even put it up. But um, Hebrews 7, 7, 1 and, and on, mm -hmm. you know, whatever. I just want to know, is this explaining Yahushua? Was yes, it explaining man. him before time? You know, I just want to know. So oh. That's all. Praise you my 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 wise brother yes it is <laughs> when you look at hebrews chapter 7 it talks about the king of righteousness melchizedek right and it starts to break down right here descent right and it says melchizedek it says without descent having neither beginning of days nor end of life um, when they don't, when they took record, when they took record of their, their family, this is how everybody knew who was born from who, who, who belonged to who, like they could always double check because they had your record. They had your, who your mother was, or where did you descend from? It says that Melchizedek, they didn't know who his father was. They didn't know who his mother was. They didn't know when he was born beginning of days and they didn't know when he died. They didn't know any of those things about Melchizedek. But made like the son of Elohim. So when, they, when now you have the son of Elohim, but when you think about Messiah, he had a mother, right? They knew where he descended, right? He was born, right, on this earth. And he died. Matter of fact, we have the... We have the, the um, I think we have the year of when Messiah died. We have the, the year of when he was immersed. We have, we have a lot of those things historically. So what is this referring to? It's talking about being a priest continuously. It's talking about being everlasting. It's talking about the son of Elohim, not on when he was on earth, but the son of Elohim's identity before he was born on this earth, before he had a descent in Judah, 
he was not descended from anyone on earth, nor did he have a recognition. They didn't know where he began and they didn't know when he ended. I mean, we know the, the son of Elohim died. So this is a very clear statement that Melchizedek, the, the, the acknowledgement of the son of Elohim was that he was, there was like some unknown information. When we looked at Micah 5, 2, it says that his goings forth or his descent was from everlasting. Can somebody pinpoint a point in time in everlasting? No, nobody could pinpoint when Messiah was begotten before earth was created. Nobody can do that. <laughs> and is Messiah continuous? Messiah is continuous. So this man, Melchizedek, has a similarity to the son of Elohim. But one of the emphasis here is that the priests of Levi, the sons of Levi, descended from Levi, right? Let me see if I could find that verse. I think uh, here it is. All right. So it says, uh, by the Levitical priesthood under it, it says uh, the priest should arise after the, it says after the order after the order of Melchizedek and not after the order of Aaron. And I want to, I want to show what this word order means because every time there's a comparison to Messiah it's talking about his, his, the fact that he has been begotten by the father, not, not Mary. Um, there is some instances talking about that, like referring to Judah or did David, but there's no emphasis. This is a priesthood, right? So look at what it says. The order of Melchizedek, that word G5010, it means succession, right? Succession. Let me do a pop quiz real quick. Anybody know what succession means? Yes, Kala. To come afterwards. To come after, yes, yes. Who who usually succeeds? Well, well, succession is usually used in context of, um, in modern terms, political party, but in ancient terms, like uh, royal lineage. So lineage, yes, yes, uh, like a heir, right? Exactly. So who was who was the order? The order of Aaron went to who? Um, his sons. <laughs> sons, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Name. <laughs> I'm sorry. Say that again. I was trying to think of the, his his son's name. Sorry. <laughs> oh yeah, no, it went to his sons. I mean, we we two of them died, and you know it was a whole mess. But the order of Aaron was down passed down by his sons and his sons only. So the succession of Melchizedek is, is there's this comparison between the succession of Melchizedek and a succession of Aaron, that Messiah was declared a priest just as the sons of Aaron were declared priest by the lineage of Aaron. Aaron was, um, he's the one that passed it down. So everyone after was, um, I think they call it a successor or something like that. I'm just using the same terms. So Aaron passed it down to his sons. And then when we look at the order of Melchizedek, it works the same way. It works exactly the same way. One, because there's already a high priest, which is Aaron. And Melchizedek means king of righteousness. Who would the king of righteousness be passing down his his uh his priesthood too. He would be passing it down to his son. And we see that in um where is it? Psalms. Psalms 110. So look at this. Verse 4. This is actually the verse that, that Messiah quotes saying that um, David was talking, hearing, um, hearing Yah speak to his son, 
speak to his master here. It says, Yah said to my master, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. So this, this whole chapter starts with Yah speaking to his son, giving his son, you know, Yah shall send the rod of, his, of your strength out of Zion. Who is it talking about? He's sending his son to Zion, right? And it says, um, then as he continues, look at what it says. Yah has sworn and will not repent. It says, you are a priest forever. So this was a continual priesthood. Remember, this is what it says. This was a, a everlasting priesthood. And it says that Yah is making this declaration. And it says, after the order, after the order of Melchizedek. What does that mean? So let's look at that. What does order mean here? H1700. It says the order, the estate, you know, the, I think there's another term referring to oh, Deborah, right? So Deborah means the words, by the words of, or the oath. Sorry, this thing is loading up pretty slow. So Yah is making an oath. He's speaking and he's swearing and he's passing something down, the order of Melchizedek to someone else. Uh, and this chapter is talking about him talking to the master. He's talking to the master. Yah said to Adoni, my master, Sit thou at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Yah shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of your enemies. Your people shall be willing in the day of your power. This is Yah talking to his son, talking to David's master. It says, in the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning, you have the dew of your youth. And then it says, Yah has sworn, I will not repent. You are, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So when we go back to the succession, it's only succession or, or heir or estates is only passed down to your son. Your, your sons is the next, is the next um, person to receive this. Let me see if there's, there was another. Okay, so here we go, right here. So you see here, so he starts to compare the Levitical priests. He said, those priests were made after and without an oath, without a Deborah, right? But this with an oath by him that said to him, by Yahuwah that said to him, Yah swear and will not repent. You are a priest after the order of Melchizedek. So, I hope this is not com that confusing, but the passing down of the priesthood, Aaron was a type or a representation of how the priesthood would be passed down. And the priesthood was passed down because of the father passing down his priesthood to his sons. Now, Yah does not die. So he doesn't pass down the priesthood when he dies. He passes it down when he makes a covenant or a promise or an oath with you. So he has a oath with his son. You are a priest forever, right? So when he makes a oath with us, we enter into not only that relationship of a son, but when we become his sons and daughters, he gives us the priesthood also. So Messiah received that priesthood prior to even coming into this world um, because Messiah quotes that verse in uh, Psalms 110 verse one saying that how is Messiah the son of David if David called him master? This is in uh, Matthew 20. I'm gonna go pick, get that verse right now. Go ahead, Wesley. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. I was just looking, trying to find the verse, but um, I just wanted to add um how uh if we look at the levitical priesthood um the original arrangement was every firstborn uh, of among the children of israel was supposed to be 
um, reserved for Yahuwah. Um, but sadly, of course, they sinned. And then instead of that, he, uh, the Levites are the one that came over to Moses' side. So he chose Moses, but um, uh, he chose the Levites uh, and Aaron. And, and he showed the pattern through Aaron and his sons. Um, but originally it was uh, everyone who right. was first born as well, which is representation of the Messiah and also given to his children. Right. Right. Representation of the priesthood going to all of his children was all the tribe's firstborn sons were um, were supposed to be dedicated to the priest. You can find this in Numbers chapter three. Um, and then they were replaced by the Levites to be a representation to every tribe that they ought to be a kingdom of priests. Um. But we'll talk about that going in soon. But that, thank you. That was a definitely an important part. Do you see the the whole point is that Yah passes down the priesthood to his children. He doesn't give, he doesn't make people priests without them first being his son. But when it, in regards to his son, he gave his son the priesthood um, in Psalms one ten. And look at what Messiah says. Messiah, let me see if I can. Messiah quotes. Psalms 110. Look at what he says here in Matthew 22, verse, um, starting at verse 42. He says, what do you think about the Messiah? Whose son is he? Now that we're having this conversation, I know everybody's going to constantly see that the, his identity as the son has been constantly introduced or attempted to be introduced to the people. But only those who remember scripture remembered who he was from scripture. So this is why we had to start from the Old Testament to come over here. So look at what Messiah says. Whose son is the Messiah? Now they said the son of David. Messiah didn't say, okay, you guys, you're right. Son of David, because he is the son of David. But Messiah wasn't asking his earthly identity. Messiah was asking his true identity. So he says, how then does David in the spirit call him master? Why is David in the spirit calling him master? And then look what he quotes. Yah said to my master, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Messiah then asks them, if David calls him master, how is he his son? Many people now would say, oh, well, he was talking prophetically. No, they, Messiah is telling him that he was presently calling him master. How can he be his son if he was currently there calling him master? Even though David was in the spirit, it doesn't mean that he wasn't acknowledging someone who was actually there. Because now they say, oh, he was talking prophetically. So he, David was probably in a trance talking about something in the future. No, Messiah's saying, why is David calling him presently master while he was alive? How is he David's son if David is presently calling him master while he was alive? It says, no man was able to answer him a word. Neither does any man from that day forth ask him any more questions. So the question still remains, whose son is the Messiah? Because the son of David is not the right answer, according to Messiah. Him being the son of David is not the correct answer. He is the son of the living Elohim, like Peter said in Matthew chapter 16. So it's interesting. He talks to, Ma he talks to Peter. He says, uh, my father revealed to you that I am the son of the living Elohim. And then in Matthew 22, he asked the Pharisees to see what they would say. And the Pharisees had no clue because the Ruach wasn't, Yah was not revealing who his son was to them because they was not submitting to his word. They was not submitting to the truth. So I want to take us to one more place just to show uh, the emphasis on his earthly birth wasn't the same as his, his birth or his identity as a son prior to him coming to, coming to this earth. So let's go to Luke. Let's go to Luke. I think it's in chapter one. Let's go to chapter one real quick to see. Oh, 
Okay, yes. So look at this, right? So in Luke chapter one, we have the angel goes to Elizabeth. And Elizabeth was barren. I think, where does it say it? Yeah, right here. So looking at Luke chapter seven, Luke chapter one, verse seven, it says that Zechariah and Elizabeth, they had no child. It said because Elizabeth was barren. Barren means that, and it says, and they both were well stricken in years. That means that she's incapable physically to have children because her one, she's, she's old. And two, her body is not producing you know, uh, eggs to be fertilized. Let's just say that. So look at how the description is, right? Look at the description of, of, of Mary now, or Miriam receiving this same miracle happening to her. Let me go down here. It says here in verse 30, it says, and the angel said to her, fear not, Mary, for you have found favor with Elohim. Behold, you shall conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Yahushua. He shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest. And the master Elohim shall give unto him the throne of his father, David. All right. So this is when he's the son of David. When he comes through Mary, that's when he's the son of David. Not before that. Look at verse 33. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom shall there be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, how is this be? Seeing that I don't know, i never been with a man. Right? The angel said to her, answered her, said, the set apart spirit shall come upon you. I want to highlight this the set apart spirit shall come upon you and the power of the highest the father shall overshadow you and therefore that holy thing that shall be born of you shall be called the son of elohim so this is going to be the earthly son of david aspect here when the spirit of yah comes on this person and then all of these things is happening in her body she will conceive a son look at what the angel compares it to in the next verse it says, and behold, your cousin Elizabeth, she has also conceived a son in her old age. This is the sixth month with her who was called barren. And then he says, for with Elohim, nothing shall be impossible. So look at this comparison. The angel is comparing the birth of Messiah that's about to occur with a woman that was never with a man with the birth of uh, John the Baptist with a woman that was incapable of having a baby. And then in verse 37, it says, with Elohim, nothing is impossible. The same way Elohim's power and Ruach was on Elizabeth that caused her body to come back to life and to be uh, conceived is the same Ruach that's going to go on her to conceive a child without a um, uh, 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 without a human person, a human man. You see that? Later on, it tells you right here, it came to pass in verse 41, it came to pass when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary that the babe leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the set apart spirit. You see that? So this is very, this is very clear that the, Sorry about that. So we see clearly that this, this um, birth, the birth of Messiah is being compared as far as a miracle is concerned, as far as the Ruach and the power of Yah is concerned, that the power of Yah, just as it moved on Elizabeth when she was barren, is the same thing that's going to move on Mary when when she has it, when she conceives not being with a man. So the idea that because just because it was without a man, all of a sudden 
this is why he's the only begotten. Well, if you look at the how he said she, he was going to be born, it was by the power of the spirit. And that's not different because the power of the spirit went on someone six months before Mary. So the power of the spirit caused a conception, you know, even though it had a uh, two partners six months before. So now that Mary is, is conceiving, the angel is saying, hey, look, your, your barren cousin has a child now and she was old and barren and Yah can do anything. You know, so I just wanted to make sure that we understood that the miracle of his birth was definitely a miracle, but there were other miraculous birth done by Yah's spirit also, including John the Baptist. Matter of fact, it says that he was filled with the spirit from the womb, just like how Messiah was filled with the spirit from the womb. So there is, there is a difference between the two people, the two uh, individuals, but the, the miracle that occurred is not the reason why Messiah is called the only begotten son, because other people were also born miraculously. So if they were born miraculously, then you can't say that the only begotten son was born miraculously this way and not miraculously that way. No, a miracle is a miracle. If it came from Yah, it came from Yah. So the only way that he's the only begotten son is because he was born before, according to all the scripture that was presented. Monair, you wanted to say something, brother? Uh, yeah, yeah. I was going to ask a question, but you, you kind of answered it um, with, with the Messiah. It clearly says that she had never been with a man, right? So there's, there's no debate in, in, I guess, who fertilized the sperm, I mean, the egg in Mary. Mm -hmm. It was the, the Ruach HaKodesh, right? Whereas yes. with, with, for example, um, Sarah and Abraham, and then in this case, um, Elizabeth and um, Zacharias, you have a male involved. So I, initially when you were speaking, I was a little confused. I was like, okay, is he saying that the Holy Spirit fertilized the egg in Elizabeth and in Sarah? Or, but then you said two partners were involved. So I was like, okay, that, you know, right. From the scriptures, I couldn't really conclude that that's what happened in the case of Isaac and John the Baptist. But you kind of clarified it afterwards. So are you in agreement with that? That, you know, uh, absolutely. the actual males involved were, okay, okay, cool. Right, right. The, the male was involved because when you look at what was going on with, with Joseph, Joseph was, he, Joseph was about to put her away because he thought, you know, he thought that she was um, unfaithful, yeah. unfaithful. Right. So he was when he came to, to get her for himself. That's when he he found out that she was already pregnant. So the idea that Joseph did it, you would have to basically erase that whole situation with the angel having to come to Joseph in his dream to tell him, don't worry, take. Let me go to that verse. Yeah, why, why do you find it? Yeah, because, you know, that was one of the things I was kind of um, for a little while struggling with, with the whole virgin birth. Mm -hmm. And then I think I watched one of your videos. And the, the last objection I had was the whole thing about the Torah, which which if you, you know, if you have a, a man that's a spouse to a woman and then someone else comes and impregnates that woman, that would be break the Torah. But then right. I think your, your response was that you know, the Torah only applies to us as human beings, not not unto the most high, right? In in a in a sense, like it was talking about our marital relationships. So it, that doesn't include um, I guess the Holy Spirit or the Ruach coming in. And so I don't know. Wait, say that part one more time. I'm sorry. So so I think your explanation was that the Torah applies. So for example, adultery applies to um a male, a human male and a human female, right? It does, it, in this case, it would be the Ruach um, fertilizing the egg in Mary. So that the Torah doesn't apply in that situation. I think that was your explanation. Oh, right, right. Well, I, I, yeah. I, it may have been part of it, yes. But it was, it was like, um, you know, the aspect of, the Ruach fertilizing the egg and, and using those same earthly 
those same earthly um, aspects to pregnancy, right? So we're looking at those aspects to the pregnancy, a seed and egg and the fertilizing of the seed and the egg. And then we have to make, no, I don't know what Yah did. All it said was that the Ruach and the power of the highest was going to come over and she was going to conceive. It was, it didn't say maybe Yah gave her an egg that was already ready, or maybe Yah put, I don't know what he did, but we, we ought not make it like an earthly thing is different as far as uh, like Joseph and Sarah, but with Joseph and Sarah, it was impossible to have a child because she was barren. If someone is barren, you can't unbarren that person, <laughs> especially if they're old in age. But Yah has to bring life back into the womb, has to bring her body, has to like recreate her body to function as it functioned before she got old. You know, so that's this is a miracle that's occurring with Elizabeth. Like she, her body was not functioning as it was when she was younger. As a matter of fact, she was probably barren when she was younger. So Yah has to send his Ruach to bring back to life that function in her body in order for her to conceive with her husband. If it was, if it was just like with uh, Mary, Mary being young and conceiving, it's, this, it's a, just as much as a miracle. And I think that sometimes we, we lessen the miracle because another person is involved. And it's just like, no, both were in desperate need of Yah's Ruach yeah. or spirit to actually make it happen. And they I, cannot I, take credit. Elizabeth and Zechariah cannot take credit for having Joe, uh, John the Baptist. They, <laughs> they only did what they normally did as a husband and wife. But nothing would have occurred if it wasn't by the power of, of the spirit of Yah. You know, same thing with Sarah, same thing with Hannah, you know, Hannah and Samuel, same thing with um, Manoah, you know, many different, many different people. Yah had to um, bless them, you know, Rachel, bless their barren, their barren womb, bring it back to life so that way they can conceive to to fulfill what y'all wanted to fulfill, you know? So that's one of the things I wanted to make sure everybody know, like we can't lessen the miracle because two people was involved over here. And one person was involved over here. No, the Ruach was involved in both times. So because the Ruach was involved both times, you can't lessen one. This was a weaker Ruach blessing. And this is a stronger Ruach blessing. No, we have to get that earthly stuff out of our mind when we're talking about Yah. When Yah does something that's just as powerful, when he takes us and he and he causes us to turn away from sin, is just as powerful as part in the Red Sea. It's the same power. The same power Messiah used to heal is the same power he used to heal. I mean, the same power he used to heal is the same power he that's used to forgive the sins. You know, so we have to, when we're looking at Elizabeth and Mary, the Ruach has went over both of them. And Yah explained to her that the Ruach was already doing impossible things with Elizabeth before he was doing impossible things with her. So it's the same power. Um, but just to confirm what you were saying, brother, it says here, it says, Joseph, her husband, being a, a righteous man, not willing to make her a public example, because in Deuteronomy, it says to take her to the elders and to stone her. It says he was trying to put her away secretly. And while he thought on these things, it says that the angel appeared unto him in a dream saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear. Take Mary as your wife. Because that which is conceived in her is by the set apart spirit. She shall bring forth a son and you shall call his name Yahushua because he shall save his people from their sins. So it's very, it's very clear that they had to tell him to take her because what was conceived in her was from the Ruach, not, you know, there is a debate going around, a, a silly, silly debate, I believe, you know, negating um, Miriam's or Mary's uh, virgin birth. So. 
I, I don't want to sidetrack the topic at hand. Mm. Um, but you know, like I, I, I like I said, I, I, I've watched a couple of other truth seekers, people who I know are really, really, really trying to find the truth, just like Assembly of You Who is right. Um, and you know, they don't believe in the virgin birth. And I looked into it for a while, and you know, I, I believe in the virgin birth. Just certain things you can't, certain scriptures you can't ignore. It said she had never known a man. Like, how do you explain that? So, so I definitely believe in the virgin birth. However, you know, the the one with the Torah is a huge objection for people and they can't get past it. And so maybe that's one thing that, you know, we could spend some time one Friday just kind of mm-hmm. digging into a little deeper. Cause, you know, I, I really my desire and one of the things I really want to see happen is that everybody who's truly seeking Yah, truly seeking Messiah, come into alignment, come into one mind, come right. into agreement on, on the various topics like the Sabbath and, you know, the virgin birth and, you know, the oneness versus Trinity versus just the father and son, you know, and like all these topics that we have, the vision, um, we just come into one mind. And so um, right. I, I wouldn't say it's, it's silly. People have genuine hangups with certain concepts. And so, you know, if, if, yeah, if we could do a study on that, uh, maybe it could help somebody. I don't know, but. but. Yeah, you know, you, you're right. You're right. I apologize for saying silly. It's, um, it's made the, maybe the, the people that I've, I've heard. Just a lot of people who don't believe in the virgin birth, they get pretty irreverent in regards to how Mary got um, the reason why Joseph was going to put her away, you know, so they get very irreverent in regards to that, um, you know. Got you. Got so, you. yeah. So I, I don't want to promote what they teach. So, uh, but yeah, yeah, no, I agree with you. I think, um, I believe that y'all will do that. We'll bring all the true people who are genuine in their minds and in their hearts to to the same one accord because the Ruach will lead them, you know. Um, but we do have a lot of work to do as far as exercising our mind and and also surrendering our thoughts because sometimes we hold on to false views because it sounds better to us or we like them or we cherish these ideas. So we hold on, we hold on to these views. So it's best to surrender the views and let scripture tell you what to, what to think. And, um, and then if that changes as you study scripture, then that's a Yah leading you. But if you hold on to something and then you try to fix scripture, that puts you in a place of, of almost like almost of a place of no return. If you are looking at yourself, like you have to fix scripture, then what is going to tell you something is right or wrong. You are going to be the determine the person who determines what's right or wrong and no one else can tell you. And that's the attitude that has been de- developing in a lot of organizations in the church, you know, in the church and these uh, Hebrew groups and whatever it is, roots, Hebrew roots groups or whatever it is, whatever you cherish is what's going to determine who you listen to. And that's not, that shouldn't be when we read scripture and that's another thing also, Re- too much YouTube videos is going to scramble a lot of people's minds. <laughs> um, but when you study and you trust that Yah is going to show you because you are his child also, and you believe in him also, then you should surrender yourself to his word and study with, you know, your brothers and sisters that's also genuine and bounce ideas, sharpen each other, bounce ideas off each other and be, be confident that when you show your information, that if it is true, someone will affirm it, but also be confident that if it is false, someone will correct it and you will grow more. It's just a matter of removing the pride. People don't like to be corrected. Um, but yeah, you're right. I don't, I don't like to call these things silly, even though I feel like it's silly in my mind. Um, but there are different reasons why people believe those things. So yeah, you're right, brother. Um, but yeah, we should we should look into those controversial topics as well, bro. Uh, Sister Shanice. Shalom. 
Shalom, sister. Shabbat shalom. Hi, I just wanted to say this. Um, the miracles were to point back to Yahuwah. Um, I think we forget mm-hmm. what miracles are. These are things that cannot be explained scientifically, yeah. <laughs> right? Like everything, the healings that Yahusha did, like healing a man that was born blind, it was things that people have never seen or never heard of. You understand? So it points back to Yahuwah. Mm-hmm. It shows like the hand of Yahuwah was in this, was involved in this. And that's why Yahuwah is meticulous. Like he does these miracles that cannot be explained on purpose. And that's what you would never be able to explain how a virgin has <laughs> is with child or how a barren it was so many barren women in the, the, the scriptures that gave birth right. um, to a child. And it was all praise and all glory to Yahuwah. Right. Absolutely. And that's, that's one of the emphasis. I want us to move away from looking at, oh, he was born as a miracle this way. And other people were born as miracles that way. Like, no, it was all, like you said, it's just, it was all by the hand of Yahuwah. But this is so he can be born and be, and have the throne of David. This is so he can come through David's line. But remember, Matthew 22, the Messiah says, whose son is the Messiah? When they said David, he said, why are you saying he's David's son? If David is calling him master. So he wanted them to understand something greater than David's lineage there was something greater than David's lineage that he was trying to uh, reveal. And, um, but praise Yah. Like if we look at these miracles, the way that it is, it's a miracle. And the way that he, he put his hand in for them is the way he could put his hand in for us. And his power would have to be at work, you know? So we need to, to, when we're looking at him being the only begotten son, we can't look earthly because there were other sons that were born by the power of the Ruach as well. And um, if the, if we're going to say it's because of that, you know, but praise Yah, praise Yah that he has his, he identified himself as a son long, you know, without having to focus on his birth. If you notice, every time he talks about how he's the son, he's not going around talking about Mary's conception. He's talking about him and his father's relationship. He's not talking about Mary, his conception. You know, um, there's never been a time in scripture where he focused on his conception. He focused on his relationship with his father before he came here. And that's why that's what he was trying to show the people. Uh, go ahead, Brother Matt, Sister Kim. Hello, um, can you expound a little bit? A little bit. You said that um, Yahusha was full of this, born full of the spirit, just like how um, John was. Can you kind of jump to where it says the spirit ascend- descended upon him as a dove and kind of break down the two? Oh, okay. No, no, I was, I was referring to the physical birth. Um, so the physical and i guess my question is like what is the difference between when he was born of the spirit like like literally and then when he was when the spirit you know okay Yeah, yeah 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 that's a good question um let me see here we go so this is this is six months before mary even spoke to the angel. So it says, the angel said to him, fear not, Zechariah, for your prayer is heard and your wife Elizabeth shall bear you a son and you shall call his name John or Yehokanah, right? You shall have joy and gladness and many shall rejoice at his birth for he shall be great in the sight of Yahuwah and shall drink neither wine or strong drink. He shall be filled with the set apart spirit even from his mother's womb. So he's not, you know, he's not, going to be filled when he's 
baptized, he's going to be filled now. He's filled now from the womb, right? In order to um, perform what Yah wants him to perform. So he says here now, uh, so remember this. He will be great in the sight of Yah, and he shall be filled with the Ruach. Then when it describes the Messiah, it says here, the set apart spirit shall come on you, and the power of the highest shall overshadow you. Therefore, the holy thing which shall be born of you shall be called the son of Elohim. So the holy thing, um, well, basically the 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 baby in the in the stomach will be filled with the ruach as well. But the difference between being having the ruach on you as a child, which I believe that those who are believers are in the covenant with Yah, there is a working that the ruach does more effectively on you on your children than it does with those who do not believe. Um, First Corinthians chapter seven says. Those who are believers, it says, then your children are, um, it says, holy. Your children are set apart because you believe. Um, the reason being is because the covenant is between you and your in your seed. It's a blessing on you and your seed. But when you're not in a covenant with him, you and your seed are, are not necessarily blessed um, the way that Yah wants you to be, you know, not blessed at all, really. That's why Yah has to guide us to the truth. So when we look at it, his immersion, there's a difference. Um, there we go, right here. It says, being filled with the Ruach, HaKodesh, he returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. So what this means is that the, the Ruach, even though the Ruach was inside Messiah from birth, just like it was inside John, when they got to an age where they surrendered their life to Yah, the immersion was a time in which now the Ruach wasn't just going to develop your character. The Ruach was now going to lead you to go perform the works of Yah on this earth, whether it be going and doing something or speaking or teaching, whatever it may be, there's a difference between when the Ruach is in you developing you and preparing you and when the Ruach is in you taking you to perform these things. And that's what was the difference between the Ruach being in them at birth and the Ruach being in them when, they're, when it's time to perform their mission. The same thing happens to us as well. When we are born again, there's a different, there's something that develops in us. The Ruach is in us, developing us personally before it starts to lead us out. That's why scripture tells us not to put people in positions of leading when they are a novice, when they're, when they're not experienced. When they're not experienced, you don't put them in positions of leadership. But you see a lot of times they do that. They put these little kids, these little children to preach, and then they, you know, find out that they have some scandals or whatever. But the difference is that one aspect of the Ruach is to develop you personally. It doesn't mean that you're not going to talk to anybody about the scriptures or anything like that. It just means that there's a development. There's something, there's a growth that's happening inside of you by the Ruach. Later on, when you make a choice to surrender your entire self to him as, an, as a person of accountability, he fills you with the spirit to guide you to perform those duties, to speak those words, to heal, to do whatever it may be that Yah wants you to do. He's using you to perform or execute missions on his behalf at that point. Does that make sense? Sis? Um, a little bit. Uh, yes. Mm. Yeah. No, 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 no. You said a little bit. So let's let's. let's what's the what's the confusion? <laughs> I guess I've always been a little conf not. I've always been a little um, unsure about when the spirit like um, comes upon someone. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. but I I said a little bit because I understand that happened in the. Um, that happened when they were selecting, I think it was deacons. They said they were looking for people who were full of the spirit or they chose right. those. 
they were pulling. Mm. And so that's why I said, I do definitely understand what you're saying. I just was kind of like, why I understand also that Yahusha went through what he went through as an example for us. And right. so uh, is that like why he, during the baptism, you know, the spirit descended or like, I don't know. And going back to what happened with Moses, you know, but uh-huh. I think vacation another time. I don't want to go too far away, but no, okay. no, because we're going into the Ruach and uh, this is a good segue into that, you know, um, you know, I think it's very important. Like when you looked at every time we're talked about Messiah, like when we just read, when he was immersed, it said, um, it says, then he, this is after he was immersed. Then he being filled with the Ruach returned from Jordan and was led by the spirit into the wilderness. So now the Ruach has taken him to different places. And then afterwards, right after he's tempted and after he has his personal thing, the personal, uh, the temptations and the development, right? Look at what it says after he's tempted by, by the enemy. Verse 14, it says, and Yahushua returned, look what it says, in the power of the Ruach into Galilee and went out a fame about him through all the region round about. And he taught in their synagogues being glorified of all. So there's a difference here because he wasn't doing this before he was immersed. He wasn't famous. He wasn't teaching in all the synagogues. He wasn't being recognized. And there wasn't, he, there wasn't a magnifying of the power of the Ruach to perform these things, but there was the Ruach was on him. Um, look at what it says in Acts, right? And I think that a lot of times we, because of these churches, we kind of, we think that there's this all-in-one package. The Ruach is a developer, is a, is a comforter. It develops people. It builds us up. Look at what, when it says here, it says that they were filled with the Ruach and they began to speak with other languages as the Ruach gave them utterance, right? So this is Pentecost when they were filled with the Ruach and they were teaching. This is Acts chapter two. Now let's go to Acts chapter four and look at what it says here. It says here, it says, Peter, filled with the Ruach, said to them, you rulers of the people, the elders of Israel, if you this day be examined of of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means he is made whole. You know, he's breaking down the teaching. He's being filled with the Ruach. Later on, it talks about the other believers. This is chapter four. The other believers that has already been immersed and has already received the Ruach. Look at what it says. They're already believers now. They're already immersed. They already received the Ruach. Look at what it says. It says, being let go, they went to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them, right? When they heard that, they lifted up their voice to Elohim with one accord, and they said, Yahuwah, you are Elohim, which have made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all that in them is. It says, who by the mouth of your servant David has said, Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against Yahuwah and against his Messiah. For of a truth against your set apart child, Yahushua, whom you have anointed, Herod and Pontius Pilate and the nations and the people of Israel were gathered together against him. It says this. For to do whatsoever your hand and your counsel determined before to be done, meaning like it was prophesied. It says, and now, Yahuwah, behold their threatenings. Grant unto your servants with all boldness that we may speak your word. So now it's a different way that he wants, that they're asking him to empower them. It says, by stretching forth your hand to heal that the signs and the wonders may be done by the name of your holy child, Yahushua. And it says, and when they prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. And look at what it says. They were all filled with the Ruach HaKodesh, and they spake the word of Elohim with boldness. Now, remember, this is Acts chapter 4. They already received the Ruach. 
But what was the difference? The difference was when they first received the Ruach, it was to do and perform a certain thing. Now they're asking for the Ruach to go and perform a greater thing, a stronger influence with miracles and healings and even bolder words. You know, so there's a difference between when we first receive the Ruach and as we grow, the more that he fills us with the Ruach is the more that we'll produce the, the works of Yah and the more that we'll glorify him. So we see that same difference with Messiah. He was born with the Ruach, but then there was a difference when the Ruach came on him at his immersion. And then after he was tempted by the enemy, he came back with power and there was a different manifestation that the Ruach used him for. Where to the point where everybody knew him now, you know, was was that a little bit more clearer? Absolutely. Um, the last the last thing can you touch on Acts two thirty eight? Is that what you're talking about at the end of the passage that you just read in Acts four? You said okay. So you said Acts two thirty eight. It says, and then Peter said to them, "Repent and be immersed." Yes. Yes. So all these people, right, all these people were being immersed. And and then it said that they were fellowshipping. It's going to keep telling you that they were eating, breaking bread together. Look, they sold all their possessions and they lived together. So by the time they get to Acts chapter four, these people are just speaking, speaking the good news of what's happening to them. And when they're doing that, they're getting these threats and they're being thrown, you know, threatened to be thrown in prison and beaten and all these things. And they're not they're scared, but they don't want their fear to stop them. So what do they do? They ask for the boldness. They ask to be filled so they don't have to even even be affected by the fear. They're so consumed with Yaz Ruach that they want to do more for him and not be hindered by those threats and all of those things. You know. So, uh, And also they wanted to convince their brethren. They wanted to convince those people. So this is what happens. This is this is so important for us to understand because what the churches teach and what other people teach, you know, other people teach, you know, that the that the word is the spirit, right? Uh, even though there's a true aspect to that, and then some people in the church they teach that, you know, you you get the spirit and then you got everything. You just you just filled. You got everything you need for the rest of your life. And scripture doesn't teach that. Scripture teaches that there's a measure that grows. As you grow, there's a measure of the Ruach that grows in you until you reach a certain, the, the stature of Messiah. The stature of Messiah is that he was filled without measure. We are filled according to our faith. So as our faith grows and our understanding grows, then we are filled even more until he fills us to that stature that, that he wants us to do, until he pours it out on us, which he promises in Joel chapter 2 that he's going to pour it out. And those signs and wonders will show. I hope that that was um, just an, just another aspect of how the Ruach works in our lives. I think this is very important for us to understand because we shouldn't be thinking that everything is already given. And then therefore there's this confusion. How come this is happening? How come, how come that's happening? How come I don't understand? How come this is, or, or how come I'm still feeling weak or how come, yeah, well, there, when there's a presumption that we have everything already and we're not developing and we're not maturing, and sometimes people who receive the Ruach, they think they're not babes anymore. And you just received the Ruach. You've been studying the word for a week and you think you're not a babe. And this is what destroys people, that, that idea that there's not a development that the Ruach does first before there's a pursuit of a mission. Our mission is where we are at first. Just like the Acts of the Apostles. When they got the Ruach, they didn't start traveling the world. When they got the Ruach, they dealt with home. They dealt with whatever was around them, their families, their friends, the synagogues that they went to. Everybody knew them already. Everybody already knew them. That's why they were like, look at these fishermen. Like, I know them. They were fishermen. I see them all the time. And now they're talking with these different languages, you know. So after that, just like Messiah, when Messiah first started his ministry, 
What did those Pharisees say? Don't, wait, don't we know his brothers and sisters? Isn't this the carpenter's son? Like they what? They knew him already. You know, so we need to understand that when the Ruach comes on us, we first, it first affects where we are. We don't start going overseas to Dominican Republic, start building schools. No, you start to develop yourself. You start to let Yah come into your mind and come into your heart, start changing your attitude, your character, your practices, all these things. And then when you start to see the passion that you have to do more, you go to Yah and ask him for more. You don't go to the Philippines and start doing stuff like you you stay here and you do what Yah wants you to do and then you let the ruach take you where you need to be at that time you know um so praise Yah, praise Yah. let's uh let's go to brother charles and then brother andre yeah praise Yah. um can you hear me yeah i can hear you yeah if um if you was trying to go to some other verses, you can go on here. And plus, if it's, you can let Andre go on here because uh, I already spoke. Uh, I'll try to remember what the question I want to ask. Oh, but, sorry. You, you forgot? So go ahead. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm just trying to remember it so I can, so I can say how I got it in my head. It always comes okay. out different when I speak it. So okay. You can let brother go. All right. Well, raise your hand back. I'm going I'm to go to Andre. Go ahead, brother Andre. Shabbat shalom, everyone. Shabbat uh, shalom. Okay, so I assume you can hear me. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Um, so I actually would have tons of questions, but I understand that it's not possible to go for all of them because uh, everybody wanted to ask something as well. No, uh, no, no. If you have a question, we could. We could, wherever you want to go. I'll try to, to summarize as much as possible. I would say my very first question, since I'm, I'm new here, is uh, regarding the questions that we submit over the website, if uh, how it usually works, because I have submitted some, uh, I would say in the beginning of the week, uh, but up to this moment, I haven't got uh, an answer, so. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Um, yeah, matter of fact, I'm going to, I'm going to answer those questions um, today or tomorrow. So I'm, you're going to receive an email. I'm going I'm to address those, all those questions, all right? Praise as well. Praise you. <laughs> well, just that I had an idea, but uh, to to follow here the same, but uh, yeah, praise yeah, <laughs> to follow the same, um, to use the opportunity here, since you're uh, like to use it, the team that we are talking about here, that you you've been talking, um, I keep having, I keep getting the same, um, how can I put that, the same. affirmations, the same declarations, the same um, statements, better say it, from a friend of mine, uh, we are, we have a, a, a telegram group uh, that uh, it's called uh, walking towards the aim and being the aim, uh, Yahuwah. Uh, and the, in, the, in the cover picture of the, of the group, has basically uh, the, the transliterated uh, tetragram. There is uh, Y, H, uh, W, H. And uh, we are uh, basically always talking about scriptures in the group. And uh, lately, this um, matter about the, the name of the Almighty has mm -hmm. come up. And uh, well, I don't use any other names anymore, um, different than Yahuwah, Yahusha. Mm -hmm. uh, don't even dare to, to to do it different. And it looks like there is one of the other group members who's starting to wake up for it as well. But there is another one. One of the members. Another one of the members keeps telling always the same that uh, today, for example, this uh, Pentecost uh, has uh, been brought up and uh, someone said, yeah, I have already read about uh, um, uh, a lot about this, this issue about the name of the, he used the, the corresponding in Portuguese for the L-O-R-D word, 
And then I have thought about it very much, and I'm always getting blocked in the in the phenomenon of the Holy Spirit in Pentecost. And uh, everybody would understand the same language, despite of their many different languages and tribes at the moment. Uh, and then that was a comment of one of the group members. And then right over that, another group member commented, gave the following statement. Uh, what should have, and I'm translating it right now. What should have, and quoting, what should have happened what should have happened if would have really had the, the necessity of revealing the name of the Almighty was that everybody there should have listened correctly the name of the Father, and that didn't that didn't happen because there is no such revelation. End of quote. So, uh, basically, this person always keep saying that I understand because he hasn't had uh, this revelation that we have had. Uh, and he keeps saying that there is no such thing and that basically, um, how, how is that he says again, that the, the thing about the name of the Almighty and the, the pronunciation of it, that both of them are basically human invention, human creation that came after uh, that, uh, that the Almighty didn't reveal his name to Moshe because then he would have basically just said, again, I'm using his words, I'm quoting, so uh, that he would have just said, I am what I am. So I, I just keep wondering how, because I already tried uh, from different perspectives, different uh, didactic, uh, different uh, pedagogic uh, tools, uh, how, whatever you, you can imagine, uh, perhaps uh, was still not enough. I need to, <laughs> I keep praying for him. I keep uh, uh, asking so uh, yeah, I can give him the revelation as well uh, as I, Great for all of the members of the group, and uh, seems like one of them is starting to wake up. Um, but yeah, a part of that, I don't know what else can I do. What else can? I, I, yeah, I, I I hear what you're saying. Um, you can see my screen right here. Yeah. Okay, so this is this is uh, Yahuwah talking to um, Moses, right? And it says here in verse two of Exodus six. So one of the things that is very important to do is we don't have to have a we don't have to have a a dialogue without scripture you know i think a lot of times we try to explain truth um instead of presenting truth right um and and when i say presenting i don't mean like pr making a presentation or giving a presentation I simply mean sometimes it's best for you to ask the question, you know. So when somebody says the name wasn't revealed to nobody, you go to the scripture and you say here in Exodus 6, 3, it says, I appeared unto Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob by El Shaddai. But by my name, Yahuwah, was I not known to them, Right. Like that, huh? Sorry, yeah. Let, let me stop you right there. Just uh, uh, well, here we are seeing the, the the scripture in English, and then I I I would basically get, have it in Portuguese. The problem is like uh, basically what stands there, and that's what he's not getting. Like it stands always the in in English stands the words with G O D and L O R D and so on. But even if I get uh, and show him a blue letter Bible or something like a different version, Sefer, let's say, and 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 show with the tetragram and and, and the Elohim and so like uh, and and go further and and, and try to to get uh, uh, lexical dictionaries and show the right. meaning of those words in Hebrew. He will basically keep coming up always with the same. Yeah, that, that, that's that's it. That's one it. Thing. 
one one of the thing is is all right and i think somebody asked me this question this week nobody uh, uh the, the the scriptures are not um the original script the scriptures are not that we possess our versions right so sometimes I, I know what you're saying sometimes people look at um there's these people that they're called the king james only right i think some they're like a baptist 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 group and they are king james only they don't believe that there's any flaws in that particular english translation so to them it doesn't matter what it says in hebrew or even greek whatever is written in that english version is the correct thing and that's that's not really the way you're supposed to look at these versions even these hebrew versions you still have to check to see if they determine the correct um, you know, especially when there's confusion, determine the, rec- the, the correct uh, uh, word or the correct translation or whatever it is. So if a person wants to look at the Portuguese, uh, the, the, I forgot, what, whatever the language, whatever language they're speaking in, and they want to say, this is kind of what I'm focusing on, you don't have to go back and forth with what it says you just have to tell them hey this is not the scripture this is a version someone translated it from something else oh uh-huh. so you're relying hey if anybody who wants to speak has to raise their hand you have to raise your hand first and then wait until you call all right uh but zion oh. yeah no problem so any version that exists, you will have to go back and check the original language. Um, if you're not willing to check the original language and you want to just stick to what it says there, um, you know, well, even if you stick to what it says there, I don't think there's, there's translations that take this particular verse here. Where it says uh, Exodus 3.6.3, 3, where it says, my name is Yahuwah. Was I not known to them? I don't think that it, even in the King James, it says, it doesn't say Lord. It says, it says Jehovah, but it doesn't say Lord. So this verse in many different versions is not going to say like the ESV may say Lord, but that's, you know, if you go to the Sefer, you have the T.S., you know, so what you want to do is you want to tell them or emphasize, hey, the reason why I'm saying this is because we're looking at a version. And um, sometimes people have so much trust in their version that they don't really dive deeper in their study to see, to, to make sure that the version is correct. And, um, you know, unfortunately, you really can't go further until they're ready to actually study deeper in that, you know. Um, you know, but there is ways to go around it. A lot of versions still do place his name there in the scripture. So it will be beneficial for you to collect those ver- those verses that has his name in that version. Or did they take it all out? Brother and Andre? Uh, so I, sorry, I didn't got your last question out. You said they took them all out? I, I didn't get to the last thing that you said. The just last oh, thing. I was saying that for you to collect in, in many versions of the scriptures, there's many instances like here, uh, Psalm 68, 4, it says, my name is Yah. There's many different instances in which they, they use his name. And, and if they say the word hallelujah, you can even use that. <laughs> you could even use that. You say, why are you saying hallelujah? You're talking yeah. in Hebrew. I, I said that. I use that. And then yeah. one other thing that came up and he said was basically he tried to say, I, I, I think I, 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 I worked around and I, and I could show, show at least if not to him for the rest of the group, I suppose, 
that uh, there was no contradiction on, on what I was uh, presenting because uh, he, he, he tried to say that even, for example, uh, if you use the, the, tetragra the tetragram mm -hmm. uh, and instead of using the, tet the tetragram ju just like a, it is, if instead you use the names Yahuwah and Yahusha like that, uh, this by itself would be a transliteration. So where is the logic if you say that a name should not be translated, uh, transliterated, for example, to the point where it comes to the word with, with J, and uh, like, uh, so, and in the end, you're giving a pronunciation to something that should be unpronounceable, which we know that is the whole thing, how everything started, to let uh, the name of our of our father to be forgotten, to be uh, called in vain. Right. Well, pronunciation. Sometimes pronunciation. There, there's a there's a way to study that I think that pronunciation kind of, you know. And then I'm gonna I'm gonna move on, but I'm gonna answer your questions online. But I think pronunciation is not always the problem. Yeah, it, I think is the way that a person studies, the way that the person views certain scriptures. And sometimes pronunciation won't be a, a beneficial conversation with, with a person that's still learning about the Torah or a person that's still learning about Hebrew, you know. Um, so sometimes when you try to go about pronunciation, it won't really work until the person is ready to dive deeper in their own study of Hebrew or in their own study of the Torah and things like that. You know, so I would say just consider your environment, make sure that you're, you're bringing out the main issue or, or a main problem, you know, in scripture, the main problem is sin and unrighteousness. And if a person is still not understanding Torah, and they're walking in sin. Pronunciation is not is not uh, going to benefit them if they don't believe that they should walk in righteousness, you know. So, um, but I'm going to look at the the questions that you have and see if um, and I'm going to remember what you asked today, and I'm going to see if I could uh, expound a little bit on the email. Okay. That's great. Thank you very much. No problem, brother. Thank you for your question. Praise you. All right. Uh, hey, Brother Charles, and then I have uh, Batzion. Go ahead, Brother Charles. And yeah, I mean, if Brother want to go ahead, uh, I'll wait till the last song. I'll okay. Switch. All right. Uh, Batzion. Are you there? Uh, I have nothing. You sure? Yes. Okay. okay. I'm, I'm I'm listening and I'm I'm getting more of a revelation of what's going on because, like, you know, he said I could talk to people and try to get them to understand, and then they want to just keep on trying to not believe. But I have let the ruach had came to me and gave me the. The understanding, so it was like I was elevated and I was happy. So, just listening and learning as we go along. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, some, sometimes is you know I'm I was one of those people, hard headed about the Torah, about you know certain things because I was comfortable where I was at. Um, it was right. until I showed me that there's there was no reason for me to be comfortable where I was. And that I, I was in so much need and dependency for him to show me and lead me and help me. And I got fooled. I fooled myself thinking that I've, I've reached a certain point. So Yah is very good with how he shows us that we need more. You know, and sometimes when we come to people and we show people, uh, oh, this, this particular topic that we want them to experience and enjoy, right? Right. When we approach them in there, Yah is telling them, is, is like, wait, you have a bigger problem over here. You know, wait on that right there. But wait, when you get this, then you'll get that. And sometimes we don't see that sequence. 
we only see how good this information was when we learned it. And we kind of forget that they may not be able to receive it because they may not even understand certain things that allows you to receive it. You know, when I wasn't, I was rejecting the feast because I was rejecting Taurus. When somebody told me about feasts, I was like, what you doing with feast? Get out of here with the feast. <laughs> we don't keep the Torah, you know? So when I understood the Torah was important, then I looked at the feast and then I realized the feast was important. But before I realized the Torah was important, the law collectively, nobody could bring the feast to me. I was rejecting it, you know? So praise Yah that he saw my hangups. And that's why we also give that grace to other people. Like, okay, I, you, you hung up somewhere. I, I may not know where you hung up at, but I'm going to let Yah kind of guide our conversation and, you know, wait, wait until the right time. Proverbs says, that a word in due season is pleasing to the, to the heart or something like something along the lines, like a word in due season. Like we need to make sure that our words is at the right time, not when we want them to know, but when Yah has opened their heart to to understand, then they will know because it's Yah that gives the increase. All we do is sow seeds. We sow seeds and we water. That's all we do. And I, 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 I agree. Praise you I agree. Praise you sis. All right. We're going to end it off. And, and praise you that we started with the Ruach. We're going to start going into the elements of the Ruach. So because one of the things that just like how we forget the fact that his only be, he's only begotten because of a certain time that he was begotten. Sometimes we lose sight of how we're using the term Ruach. And so we're going to look through scripture and show how the word Ruach is used so we could understand what Ruach means and how the scripture uses the term Ruach, you know. But we're going to close with um, Brother Charles. And then next week, we're going to talk about what is the Ruach. Uh, Brother Charles. Yeah, um, praise y'all. You can hear me. Yeah, I can hear you, brother. I'm kind of, I think I'm making a statement question. I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm just be honest. But um, I just got a, it's like a question. Like, so Hebrews 1, it mentions, it says, if it says, which of the angels have I called the son, right? So if he not calling them a son or nothing, then he's created everything through Yahushua. So, so um, if John 1, 1, whatever says, Elohim is the word and the word is with Yah and the word is Yah, then who was he talking to if, if it wasn't no other sons? And who, what father would make, what father would make, well, put it like this. Look, Hebrew 1 said, who would call the son? Then if Adam was showed that he was he was shown in Genesis, who was he saying, let's make man in our image too? If the son, if the angels aren't sons, who right. would he else who would he get that type of authority to to, you know, why would we be heirs to anything but his son? Oh, right. Right. Oh, so so and another thing I was thinking like. Who is he talking to in the beginning? And then if Yahuwah was if Yahuwah was speaking, if Yahuwah is 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 is, is, is if Yahuwah is supposed to be his exact the actual word, then who is he talking to again? And that brings me to this also. Um when it says, when it says you can talk against or blaspheme the son but you, but if you blaspheme the father or the ruach there's no forgiveness then if they was the same then why wouldn't they say the same for the son then if they the same why can't you why mm-hmm. can't you talk against the son then right and what? also it's something yeah. else that I want to bring up um I was finna say I think I come in my father's name you know but we're not the same, you know. Um, 
What I forgot what else I was gonna bring up, man. He said, I had he, said he said if I, he said I come in my father's name, if I came in my own name, you would accept me. But I have a I have a greater witness than myself. So he said, if I come in my own name, you would have accepted me. But I'm coming in my father's name. That's another thing. If if they're the same being, he's not even. He said, I'm not even coming in my own name. If they're the same being, then Yahuwah will be his name, his actual name. You know, but he says, I'm not coming in my name. I'm coming in my father's name, showing that there's a difference between his name and his father's name. You know, but I, I like that you brought out. Go ahead, Brother Charles. You wanted to bring out something else? No, I can't think of it now. <laughs> yeah, no. Look, Hebrew, you brought out Hebrews 1. I would point this out real quick. Hebrews 1. So when you have Yah, right? The most high, nothing is comparable to him, right? Then you have something that was brought forth that is the brightness of his glory, right? The express image of his person. But the crazy thing is, even though Yahuwah is the most high, he's all glory, all power, the thing that comes from forth from him and bears his brightness and his express image is still his son. It's still a son. It's not, it's not a twin. It's not like a, a, a duplication of, of the same exact thing. It's, it's my express image, my brightness, and it comes out from me and it's a son. So, Guess what? He says, let us make man in our image. So he makes Adam in his in righteousness, right? In his likeness and in his image. And look at what Adam is. Adam is a son. So Yah is not duplicating himself as a bunch of fathers or a bunch of most highs. You understand? Every time he duplicates himself, it's a son. When he made man, it says Adam, which was the son of Elohim. When Messiah came forth, it was his express image. It was his son. What does it say in Proverbs? Proverbs 30, verse 1, I mean, verse 4. What is his name? What is his son's name? So that's just another instance of understanding whatever comes out of Yah in his express image and brightness, you cannot duplicate the most high. What Yah is doing is he's presenting children. He's, he's making his children, his created beings, his sons. That's why he says, you have begotten, I have begotten you. I'll be a father to you. You will be a son. Then when they make man in our image, Adam is referred to as the son of Elohim. You see, so we have to understand that there's no, Messiah is not like a, a replica, like a, like, like Yahuwah's twin. He's not Yahuwah's, you know, he's his son. He's the word of Yah. He came forth from Yah. He bears the image of Yah as a son, as a son would bear image of their father. And every time he creates, and even us, when he restores us and he's uh, transforming us, guess what? We're going to bear the image of his children. We're not going to bear the image. We're not going to be little, Yah, little Yahs. We're going to be his children just as Yahushua was his son, just as the word of Elohim was his son, you know, but anyway, uh, Brother Charles, you want to say something before we close? Yeah, uh, again, like, if if they all, three of them was one, again, he came to die for our, so, for our sins, so we can't be forgiven, and if they is the same people, then 
if you blaspheme the son, then there ain't no forgiveness. Everybody's going to die. Everybody's going right. to not be forgiven because if they all three was the same. So right. there's no forgiveness nowhere. And then again, I want to say, um, I believe that when the Ruach came upon Yahushua, I believe it was just like when Yahushua said, I say this, when he was talking around the people, he say, um, I say this or either, I'm glad you said this because not 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 that I he didn't know, but so men can 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 understand or I forgot how it go. He, I forgot exactly how it go, but I believe the Ruach came upon him so that men can see that it was a difference and that his father was blessing him with the Ruach. It, it isn't that, you know, so, so. Um, Praise God. Yeah. Praise Absolutely. God. Praise God. When, when he was growing up, he was a righteous man. When the Ruach came on him, he he was, his fame went across Jerusalem and he was known as a teacher now. <laughs> so he, he, you know, is a difference between somebody growing in righteousness, which it says in scripture that he grew, he grew in wisdom and he grew in stature. And then when Yah gave him the Ruach, he began to perform what Yah wanted him to do. Um, you know, and he submitted to that. Praise Yah. Um, the identity of the Messiah is what we have our identity in. He is the son. This is why we become sons and daughters is because we are being transformed in his name. So he is giving us the image of his father the way that he has the image of the father. So he is giving us a reflection in our minds and in our hearts and in our actions and in our, in, you know, he's, he's transforming us so we can reflect the same thing he was born to reflect. You know, so this is why we are children. The moment you remove Messiah from being his son, now what makes and and Yahuwah's and Yahushua is not his son anymore. Why would you be his son? Why how come you are still his son and his daughter if Yahushua is not really his son? You see? So you take away that identity from Messiah, then you're going to take that identity away from you because the only reason why you're a son is because you're a joint heir with him. So because you're a joint heir with him, that's what makes you his son and daughters. So we, we have to make be very careful. You take him away from being a son, then you have no right to be a son or a daughter either. You know, so praise God. Praise God that he sent his son that we can believe in him and his name and he will transform us into sons and daughters of the father um, and reconcile us back to where we, where we need to be. So praise Yah. Um, I know this was a, a pretty difficult thing because there's so many different topics that stem off of the only begotten son, the virgin birth and all these different things. So um this is Q&A, so you guys could, if there's any conflicts next week, you can bring the same the same questions. Don't, don't think about anything going off or anything like that in regards to what we talked about. Um, next week, we're going to be focusing on the Ruach, and um, we're going to kind of dissect that pretty slow because we this is like, this is what we have now. This is what Yah has left us to develop us and to use us and to empower us. So we need to understand what this is, you know? So next week we're going to be touching on what is the Ruach? What is the spirit of, of Elohim? And we're going to understand like, how does, where does the father and the son, um, where does the father and the son in all of that stuff? You know, where, what does the Ruach have to do with the father and the son? And we're going to, we're going to show it from scripture. So praise Yah. And, um, you know, may Yah bless everybody today and keep you and, and just reveal himself to you guys even more today. And uh, Shabbat Shalom. Hope to see you guys tomorrow. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom.